Well, this is my <clears throat> New Year's Eve video. I hope you have a happy New Year and you're having a at a party. <clears throat> I don't think 2024 is going to be a very good year for anybody, uh, but uh, hopefully I'm wrong. This is a different type of video. I wanted to talk about how the West or NATO or the United States, any way, any way you want to look at it, cannot win a modern war. And to understand uh, where I'm coming from, let's go back. We could go back to many, many different wars. Uh, and there's different ways of fighting them. We're talking about kinetic warfare, not economic. See, China's been waging an economic war on the United States. And not only that, China's uh, been engaged in clandestine activity within the United States. They've captured many of our politicians uh, who no longer represent the uh, interest of the United States. Uh, they're more about lining their pockets and, uh, well, actually, if you want to say the Manchurian candidate, I believe uh, he's more representative of China than he is of the United States, but uh, just my opinion. So let's get back to the nature of, of modern war. I guess the first really modern war, well, all right, let's go back to the Civil War and how things changed. The Civil War was defined by repeating rifles. You know, the South had the muzzle-loading uh, weapons, and, and of course the North had the, uh, uh, the, the they developed the repeating rifle. That gave them a huge uh, advantage at the Battle of Gettysburg. The other thing was the invention of rifle cannon. A lot of people don't understand what, you know, for, before that there was Napoleonic, Napoleonic cannon. Okay, and a Napoleonic cannon... Um, it just hits. It would hit the enemy uh, from about a hundred yards out. You know, maybe even two hundred, uh, and it and obliterate charging forces at the cannons. But if you have enough men, you can overwhelm those cannons. Now you're going to lose a lot of men in the in the meantime. But uh, uh, but yeah, and and so we're going to get into the the meat grinding aspect of war and how you can fight it. So the, the frontal charge on the Napoleonic cannon, uh, although I don't agree with it, but it, it would work, especially if you have to take a certain position. So you're going to sacrifice a certain number of men to save your army or, or a lot more. And, you know, that's general's decision. Uh, so that's how wars were fought up until the Civil War. Well, the rifle cannon, uh, what happened at the um, Pickett's charge was the rifle cannon were able to hit the southern charge about a mile out. And they had shells that would either hit the ground and explode, or they would actually explode in the air above the uh, of the southern soldiers. And so, if you ever study that battle, uh, the, the uh, I think the quote from one of the northern uh, generals, or or maybe it was just a, a northern soldier, was "We knocked them over like bowling pins." And uh, so, by the time they even got to the cannon, there was there wasn't. I think about well, I don't know how what percentage, but it was it was. It was above 60%, maybe even more than 80% had been decimated uh, before they even got there. Uh, I remember Pickett saying uh, to Lee, Lee goes, you know, gather your forces. And Pickett said, what forces? I got nothing left. You know, so that was the, so that was a, a general, General Lee, not understanding how the uh, technology had changed in warfare. Okay, uh, so that was the difference. And then, of course, you also had the ability of the North to outproduce the South because they had all of the factors. And that's why Lee invaded the North, because he knew that if he didn't take out the industry of the North, uh, that the South was doomed to lose. Now, the war went on for another four or five years, but after Gettysburg, I'm pretty sure that General Lee and, uh, and uh, pretty much the, the Southern, any military officer in the in the southern command knew that the war was lost even before you know it, it had hardly begun because they failed uh advance into northern territory so let's bring it up to uh world war one okay world war one was defined well it was trench warfare which is much the same as what we have right now in ukraine isn't it amazing how warfare uh repeats itself but uh what what got them out of the trenches was the invention of mechanized warfare. And so mechanized warfare, you were able to advance on the trenches uh, after hundreds, I mean, what, millions of people died. Uh, but because they were, they, they were still, 
the Europe hadn't learned the lesson of what we had learned here in the United States. You can't frontal charge a rifle cannon. And of course, we also had the invention, I think, of, of the uh, machine gun. Now, the machine gun, you imagine in, in the Civil War, you had the repeating rifle. But in, the, in World War I, you had the machine gun. So a frontal charge over top of the mounds. And, and of course, the, the, the European generals were complete idiots. They kept telling their troops to charge. And then when they wouldn't charge, I think, what was it? Uh, one of the French commanders ordered the execution. I think he executed up to 100,000 troops, just to make an example. I mean, it was, it was insane, these generals that existed in, in World War I. So now let's bring it up to World War II. What was the, the huge invention in World War II? Well, it was air combat. Now, you had a, we used the beginning of air, 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 using aerial vehicles started in World War I, but they didn't play a significant role. Okay, but in World War II, aerial combat played a major role in, in the war. And then, of course, mechanized. Uh, so the, there really wasn't the trench warfare that existed in World War II because uh, as Germany proved with a, with a huge mechanized force, and uh, they could just roll. And, of course, the French, you know, they didn't understand how the warfare had changed. They thought the Maginot Line would, because they had these huge guns and everything, that they, they felt that they could stop the, um, the Germans. But, no, the, the Germans just went right around them <laughs> with the tanks and everything and just rolled right into France in just a couple of weeks. I mean, it was unbelievable how that took place. So they, see how warfare changed? Now, that if the French had understood how war had changed, they would have done what the Russians did, and that was to set up, you know, uh, tra tank traps. They could have mined uh, everything around uh, France with mines that would uh, could blow up. Under now, back then, I don't think that mass production of mines was, was even possible, but they did have mines in World War II. And, of course, they would have also set in tank traps uh, to trap the mechanized vehicles, but they didn't understand how warfare had changed, okay? So now, we'll bring it up to, well, let's say, just the Iraq War. Now, how had warfare changed then? Well, the Iraq War was, you know, as Colonel Mark Douglas McGregor, we were clubbing a baby seal. And we still believed in the mechanized approach to, to warfare. Uh, and so we kind of, we, you know, the same thing. We blitzkrieged the Iraqis. Uh, of course, we had air superiority, and we were using these... Uh, you know, million dollar missiles, $500,000 missiles with pinpoint accuracy to hit every target, you know, around. And of course, we had smart bombs that could guide in on, on all kinds of targets. Uh, we killed, good Lord, I, I don't even know how many people we killed in Iraq. A lot of civilians, a hell of a lot more than the Russians are doing in Ukraine. Let's just put it that way. So, uh, so then we bring it up to uh, Ukraine. Now, what have we learned in Ukraine? Well, I guess the, the next big advent in warfare has been drones, okay? So we, we've still got the mechanized warfare, which is what we tried with the Ukrainians. Well, see, they were still following the NATO approach. The NATO approach just believed that, that, that warfare hadn't changed since Iraq or World War II and that a blitzkrieg of, of massive amounts of armor and, and artillery could breach any sort of uh, defensive position that the Russians had set up. Well, the Russians, they knew that that wasn't going to work. And uh, the other thing is, is mine warfare had changed in modern times. Okay, you can fire up artillery shells and lay out a minefield uh, for, against infantry in, in just a matter of minutes. You know, so the infantry can't charge across the field and attack your positions, number one. And number two, what the Russians had done because uh, you've got the deep, and of course the NATO planned on the demining equipment to be able to roll right through these minefields and, and set them off, which works for artillery-laid mines, okay? Because those mines are small enough that the, these big metal uh, rakes on the front, well, as they're setting them off, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt the, uh, the vehicle behind it. Well, what the Russians did, they were smart enough that they would clump three or four mines together, and so when the demining equipment hit it, it took out the demining equipment. Now, I can't believe that nobody thought of that <laughs> in the West, <laughs> that that would be a possibility because the Russians had eight months to put their defensive positions in place. I mean, the stupidity of our commanders in, the, in NATO is just knows no bounds. 
So that was the first. So mining warfare is, is modernized. Of course, now you've got drones. Now, one of the things that, that a military has to maintain is backwards and forwards uh, modernization or demodernization. All right. Look at how Hamas attacked Israel. They used gliders to get over the wall, the most unsophisticated thing with a little propeller on the back to get the troops over the wall. And then from the other side, they blew the wall. And then, of course, everybody could get through and they attacked and killed, what, 1,200 Israelis. Okay, so the, think about that. Little, glide, little old glider. Well, one of the things that I did not like about the United States is like I would have always thought that we would still want a propeller aircraft or a propeller fighter uh, not a, necessarily a fighter, but a propeller bomber. Now, is the survivability of, of a propeller plane in, against a missile is, is zero, absolutely zero. But if you've already exhausted the air defenses of, of your enemy, even a propeller craft in large enough numbers could go in and blow the hell out of uh, your enemy, which is exactly what drones are now. Drones are your propeller craft uh, unmanned, even the, even better than having people up in planes to come across and attack the enemy. All right, and so what's happening with drone warfare now? Well, it's, it's very interesting. It started out as they were just using them for observation, and then some, somebody said, well, you know what, maybe if we attach a grenade to the drone, if we could get it over the target, we can drop a grenade and, and down into the trenches and, and, you know, do some damage. So that was, that was like the first step. And then they said, well, wait a minute. Why can't we make these drones are cheap? Why can't we make these kamikaze drones and, and we'll just fly them in? And, uh, and that way, you know, when they hit the target, because we can, with the kamikaze drone, if we make it big enough, we might be able to take out the, uh, the armored vehicles. So that was kind of the next phase in Jordan Wilfer. So then they said, well, what about using combined arms with drones? We'll have our surveillance drones up to find out where they are, and then we come in with our kamikaze drones and hit them that way. So there was kind of the, the next advance in drone warfare. So then the next, well, the, the, the next one was, what if we could have the drones communicate with each other and create a swarm of drones, kind of through artificial intelligence, and have those swoop in on a much bigger target and hit it that way? Now, think about how the West or NATO or the United States has, has not adapted to modern warfare. We've got million dollar missiles or the Patriot missile system, which fires like two $500,000 missiles to take out a $2,000 drone. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's, how many of those, how many Patriot missile batteries are you going to uh, go through on, on uh, a thousand drones, thousand, two thousand uh, dollar drones coming in on your position. You see how they didn't plan for modern warfare? If you had kept back your, or if we'd invested money into drone technology, but we didn't know. It wasn't until the Ukraine war that drones really proved out. Now we've been using drones to go up and launch like Hellfire, another thing, you know. So what the, the mistake the United States has made is they wanted to make all of, because we have a, a for-profit defense industry. There's no profit in making a $2,000 drone, okay? But a, a billion-dollar F-35 airplane that you can put all kinds of uh, fluff in, you can make a hell of a lot of money. So our, our entire defense structure is structured so that we don't go with cheap alternatives. We go with the most expensive ones. So all we've got is a bunch of junk. That's, you know, with, when I say junk, I mean, yeah, it, it'll work for about the first month or two of the war. But once the, the, these missiles, these Patriot missile batteries have expended all their, am, you know, their munitions, their million dollar rounds, uh, or think about it, even cruise missiles. How many cruise missiles do you think a ship can carry? Yeah, yeah, you can, you can hit the enemy with 100, 200. I, I mean, I imagine it's about two. How many, how many are on a ship? It's a limited supply. Let's just put it that way. So, okay, so we've limited ourselves to that. But if we had a ship, a drone ship, that could go out and, and fly in uh, a million drones, that, that would be the way to go. But no, the defense industry doesn't make any money off of that. So you, you see where I'm going with this? So our whole military is geared to fight World War II. It's not geared to fight 
2023 war. So that's why there's no way we're going to win. And, and we certainly can't win. The same principle holds in the Middle East. We've equipped Israel with F-35s and we've given them the, the Iron Dome, the, the really expensive missile technology. Well, no, all Hezbollah and Iran has to do is they're going to send in, you know, 50,000 uh, missiles coming in. And you, how many uh, Patriot missiles are you going to be able to shoot up to take out that many uh, rounds coming in? Not very many. So that means most of that ordinance is going to get through and destroy Israel, but it's going to obliterate it to the ground if Iran enters the conflict. But if you're like uh, Lindsey Graham or John Bolton, you know, they, they want that to happen. And plus the drones, you, you know, you're going to use a Patriot missile, $2 million round to shoot down a $2,000 drone that's coming across from Lebanon. So I, I just kind of wanted to sh show you how uh, technology has evolved. Now, so you say, well, okay, with the advent of drones, what's the need for tanks anymore, for example? Uh, you know, what's the need for um, Bradley fighting vehicles or bringing infantry up? Why can't we just, uh, you know, bring them up in pickup trucks, drop them off, and, uh, it, you know, and then get the hell out of Dodge, you know, and pray that you don't get it by, by drones? Well, as you can see, you know, there was another advance in drones. I forgot about this. So what the uh, Ukrainians and the Russians learned is, you know, no longer can you walk freely in the trenches. So what they've done is they've eradicated fortifications in the trenches so that they can hide further underneath the ground. So now, what was the next advent in drone technology? They're called sticky drones. <laughs> I, thought, I don't know who named them. It seems like a weird, but it's an it's appropriate name. So what you do is you come in and you, you, the drone flies in on the fort, because you got a surveillance drone. So the first drone, the surveillance drone's up, the first drone comes in and it gets on top of the uh, fortified structure. Boom. And it just sticks there. I mean, it really does look like it just sticks. So then the second sticky drone comes in and it sticks there. Then the third sticky drone comes in and it sticks there. And so on and so on until you have enough explosive power. And then, of course, uh, and these were well, the ones that I saw had motion detectors. So the first time that somebody comes out from that hole in the ground, those sticky drones go off. So not only do they kill the person coming out, but they also take out that bunker. Because how, how deep do you think that bunker is? You can't dig yourself but so far underground, especially in Ukraine where there's mud and, you know, water underground. I mean, you know, uh, it's not like in Gaza where they've had plenty of time to get, because they knew they had to get about 60 feet underground because they knew the Israelis were going to come in and, you know, drop bombs everywhere. So that was, so you see how drone technology is evolving. But so what's the next thing in drone technology? Well, now you see the Russians walking around with these uh, electronic warfare guns. Coolest thing I ever saw. They, they shoot it up in the air, so with the drones coming in, or actually they can knock the drones out of the air because the drone loses communication, you know, whether it's through, it's through GPS or whether it's, you know, being controlled from behind. So they can, and so that was kind of the next thing. And then, of course, now what the Russians are doing is they're equipping their vehicles with electronic warfare technology. So they actually have, there's a switch, you cut it on, and the electronic warfare technology kicks off. And so when the Ukrainians come in to try to hit the vehicle, the, the, the drone loses uh, its, its guidance and boom, it goes off beside the vehicle. Boom, it goes. I, I watched one video where about four or five drones never even hit the vehicle because they had the electronic warfare. So you see how things are advancing. So now drones are countering drones. What's the next advent in drones? Well, the next advent in drones is going to be drones killing drones. And we already saw this. Russia's developed a drone now that can knock the Ukrainian drones out of the air. Now, that's just beginning. That's just beginning. I only saw one video. I think it might be a prototype. So, so you see how drone technology is advancing. So I wanted, I'm getting to the, the point of all of this is the backward technology. All right, so a tank's survivability, survivability with drones flying over the place is about zero. Okay, so what's the, what's the point of having a tank? All right. Well, as we learn more and more about how to deal with the drones, the tank becomes more and more survival. Not only that, eventually, drones are going to be history. That's what I'm predicting. Because eventually, you're just going to have drones taking drones out. You know, so drones are going to become ineffective. 
if you're going to be flying drones up, now I mean, when I say ineffective, I mean much less effective than they are in this war. So in other words, you're going, to, you're going to have drones up taking out drones. You're going to have surveillance drones up. You're going to have bombing drones up. You're going to have suicide drones up. You're going to have sticky drones up. There's going to be drones everywhere. But I mean, a tank moving underneath of all this activity taking place up in the air, eventually the drones are all going to destroy all themselves. So now that's where you want your backward compatibility. You got to have the gods of war, the artillery. You've got to have the tanks. You got to have the fighting vehicles. You got to have trained soldiers. So, and I also wanted to go through another aspect of war. So, Russia's been fighting a war of attrition. Okay, and what does that mean? Well, let's go back to World War II uh, and how the Soviet Union defeated uh, Germany. And this was, it's actually kind of sick what they did. So they, when Germany launched their sixth army into Russia, of course, I think it went on for like two years. I don't, and that was the big mistake that Germany made. If Germany hadn't attacked Russia, they could have taken all of Europe and, and they should have just been happy with that because uh, Britain wouldn't have survived, you know. So, you know, what is, would the U.S. have come in from Africa? I mean, I don't, I don't think so. I think that once all of Europe and Britain was underneath German command, I don't see how you're going to unroot the Germans. It would have taken 50 years to get them out of there. But anyway, let's, let's get back to history. So when, when Germans came into Russia, you know, the Russians pulled back, pulled back, pulled back because they didn't have the hardware to fight the Germans. And so uh, what they did was they, they had their industry, and it was just like the Sherman tank. The Panzers were, I mean, the German hardware was, at that time, was the most advanced in the world. The Sixth Army was probably the largest army that ever existed on the planet, and ever will again, hopefully. But anyway, so when they came in, the, the Russians would send their tanks out. You know, so four, four or five Russian tanks would get blown up. Think about it. Everybody's dying in those tanks. Uh, to, to maybe get one Panzer. I, I think at the beginning of the war, it wasn't even that. The Panzers were just shooting them like ducks in the field. But what were the Russians doing? They were exhausting the, Rus the, the, the uh, German supplies. Now, the German command lied to Hitler and told them that the Luftwaffe could supply or you know, resupply logistics. Okay, You've always got to have logistics and war. You can't advance on the enemy if you can't feed your troops or if you can't get ammunition, which is, you know, if you look back through history... That's how many armies were defeated, was they advanced beyond their logistics or the enemy was able to get behind their lines and take out their supplies, and uh, then the army just kind of disintegrated. That's happened many times in history. So the, the Russians were playing the long game, and they, it, so they allowed the Germans to just keep advancing further and further and further, and, and then they, they used, uh, I, I hate to say it, they used people as cannon fodder. And, uh, you know, they had certain troops that I guess were more important, and they would sit back with guns, and they'd say, charge the Germans, or you're going to die. Now, the, the Russian soldier had a choice. Charge the Germans, or go back and die. He was going to die either way. But the Germans at that point had proven themselves to be much more horrible than, than I guess, they felt that the Soviet uh, troops were behind them. Plus, they're still fighting for their motherland in a sick kind of way. Even though the motherland didn't, I mean, Stalin had no regard for human life whatsoever. And that's proven by the waves and waves of cannon fodder, the way he wasted his people. But what he was doing was he was exhausting all of the Russian, I mean, the German ammunition. And so the way that the Germans were finally defeated, of course, they were surrounded. Uh, in the end, they, they had nothing left. They had no ammo. They couldn't be resupplied. And 90,000 Germans ended up sur surrendering to the Russians and of those, I think only 3,000 survived because uh, the Russians at that time, uh, they weren't very uh, well treating of prisoners. I imagine that was a pretty horrible death for, for those 90,000 Germans. But it probably, I mean, I don't, the thing was they had nothing. The reason they surrendered was they had nothing left to fight with. So it was surrender and hope that the, the Russians might treat them okay or just, you know, what are you going to do? Charge across the field and let the Russians just shoot you? So, you know, it was, it was a tough decision either way. And either way, it was just a horrible decision to make. Same thing with what the Ukrainians are doing now in Ukraine. So Ukraine's getting ready to call up, well, trying to. I don't know if it was going to work. They're going to call up 500,000 uh, people 
and I don't even want to call them troops, they're going to give them a week of training and two weeks of training, stick a gun in their hand, and they're going to send them up to be cannon fodder on the, uh, on the front lines of, of Ukraine. It's horrible. And a lot of, some of these are women, uh, the disabled, uh, people with Down syndrome. So what are the Ukrainians trying to do? Well, I guess in, in their minds, maybe, the generals are thinking that they're going to exhaust the Russian uh, uh, ammunition. Well, that's, that's, that's not even possible. I just saw today that the uh, Russians are producing 50 times. From the beginning of the war to now, they've, they've increased their multiple launch rocket system uh, production by 50 times. By 50 times. Now, how is that possible? How is that possible? Well, let's talk about the difference between Russian military uh, industrial complex and the United States military industrial complex. The Russian military industrial complex serves the state. It's not for profit. Okay? And what the, what the way it's maintained is the Russians always keep their industrial complex uh, in, intact. All right. After World War II, they've always maintained their military industrial complex. So even all the way up uh, to when, when the Soviet Union fell, the Russians really weren't producing hardly anything, but they maintained their military industrial complex. They never detooled, in other words. So they've always had the capacity uh, to, to spin it up. And they've had, uh, well, you could just look at it. There's, they've had a maintenance force in there. Let's just say uh, 100,000 people. They go in and they oil the equipment and then they, you know, if they, they think they need upgrades, they, in fact, they did, a, amazingly enough, Putin, you want to think that Putin's not smart? When he saw what took place in 2014 and he saw how NATO was, uh, was arming uh, Ukraine, arming them to the teeth, okay, he ordered his, uh, his um, government to upgrade the, um, mili the uh, production equipment uh, in the factories. And so they've been on this huge upgrade uh, campaign for probably years uh, before they, you know, and, but they hadn't spun it up to produce more stuff because they weren't sure that they would have to. You know, what's, what's the point of producing a bunch of military hardware unless, but to have that industrial capacity to do it, you know, but you know, you know how, what is it, point of sale, you know, where you, you manufacture and deliver, you know, all in the same, and you just, you make just enough to, 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 to do what you got to do. You don't keep warehouses of stuff anymore. Forget what that's called, point of sale or something. Well, that's kind of what Russia did. They, they kept their industrial complex ready just in case they need it, and now they need it, so now they're just, they're churning stuff out in, in just record amounts. It's, it's insane to watch. Well, contrast that to the United States military industrial complex. Ours is a for-profit industrial complex, and I already talked about this. So, you know, but the, but the other part that I didn't talk about was we didn't maintain that industrial capacity. So the, uh, to make more profit, the uh, companies like Lockheed Martin or Northrop Grumman, they just maintained enough to, to fulfill the orders. So if they didn't get an order, and this building over here was manufacturing tanks, and they didn't get a big enough order for tanks, they just leveled it to the ground, you know, well, we're not, we don't need that no more, you know, or convert it over to, to something else that made them more money. So we don't have the industrial capacity to produce anything because it was for profit. You know, think about it. We had, during World War II, we had, we converted over the whole auto industry, we converted, a, well, we had industry back then. All industry was, was switched over to wartime. Well, after the war and World War II, all that industry went back to making private goods. So all of our military industrial capacity went away, except for the military industrial complex, which, by the way, they bought off after Eisenhower. They bought off the U.S. Congress, and they bought off the presidency, and then they kicked back to Congress to, so that they could buy them out. And so all that they've done, they're not there for the United States. They're there to line their own pockets. So there's no way that they can make anything that's worthwhile in a modern war. I guess that's it for this video. I just was wanting to explain how warfare is changing and how I think that drones eventually are going to be nullified or a much less strategic uh, uh, advantage on the, on the war field. But right now, drones rule. And uh, if, if, um, if Israel wants to go to war with uh, Iran, drones 
not only they're going to be attacking U.S. Uh, the fleet, and that's another thing that was a World War II thing. So now you've got this fleet of ships, and sitting there in the Red Sea, okay, and you've got underground uh, drones, uh, submarines that can that can torpedo those ships. You've got uh, or underwater, excuse me. You've got uh, the in the hands of Hezbollah. They got cruise missiles that can attack those ships. They've got uh, drones that can attack those ships. Well, how many? How much do you think the 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 defenses on those ships can handle? So let's say you got fifty underwater drones coming at the ship. You've got a fifty cruise missiles flying in from outside. You got a hundred drones coming at the fleet. You think they're going to be able to take all those out with with what we've got? I mean, I, I doubt that the Gatling guns are even there. One one other thing that I, so that, that that fleet of ships is going to be gone. You know, if 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 we go to war in the Middle East, I mean, it's not going to last very long because Iran's going to. We think we're invulnerable. No, the, Iran's going to take them out. Hezbollah, Lebanon, you know, uh, you and the Yemen, you know, in Yemen, Yemen could sink one of those ships if they wanted to. They just didn't want to escalate in that fashion. Yet, I, I do think we're heading for a much larger war in the Middle East. And and why in the hell we're doing this? All we got to do is tell Israel. Cease fire and everything goes, well, it won't go back to normal because I just found out today that the United States vetoed the, uh, the ceasefire. We're the sole, sole nation to veto a ceasefire in Gaza. So basically we're isolated in the world. We're isolated in the UN. We're isolated everywhere. Nobody is for the extermination of the Palestinians but the United States. I think it's disgusting to exterminate an entire two million people and be for it. These sick bastards that we have in the White House and sick bastards that we have in the Congress. I, I, I can't believe, who's for killing two million people? What is wrong with these people? I, I saw a, a video of, of people are starving in, in Palestine. They, they're getting all kinds of diseases because the, the, you know, the infrastructure doesn't work. Imagine everybody's pooping on the streets because all the buildings have been taken down. Uh, all the people with disabilities, they can't survive in an environment like that. So Israel is slowly but surely exterminating uh, the people in Gaza. The entire world is watching this. And uh, I don't think that the uh, Arab world is going to put up with this much longer. So, And then the only nation that stands with Israel is the United States. No other nation on earth, well, you think Europe's going to stand with Israel? Oh, yeah, they're going to give it lip service, but they're not going to send any troops you know, I think Britain's got one ship, but <laughs> it doesn't even work very well in the Persian Gulf. Ah, God almighty, I, I got off on a tangent. I forgot where I was going with all of this. Uh, well, I guess modern warfare. I was talking about modern warfare and how the, 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 we were fighting World War II, and now we've got 2023. So there's no way we can fight a war in the Middle East. And, and what are we going to do? How are you going to get troops on the ground in the Middle East? I think I've talked about this in a previous video. So you land 5,000 troops in Yemen. How long do you think that 5,000 Marines are going to last against 100,000 screaming Yemen conditioned soldiers that come swooping down on them as, they, as they're coming onto the beach? And probably wouldn't they, their landing craft would never even make it to the beach. And you think Saudi Arabia is going to let us land troops there? Now, we, we've got bases all over the place, but how are we going to resupply those bases when they come under attack, which they already are, as I predicted, in, in Syria and Iraq? I think the bases all around the Middle East are going to come under attack. And of course, we've given all of our munitions to uh, Ukraine, and now we're giving all of, our two, all of our 2,000 bombs to Israel to exterminate the Palestinians. And that's another thing that, that you've got to know about modern warfare. Okay, the Palestinians were willing to pay with their blood. They're, every day, Israel becomes weaker, and so does the United States. By, sec, by killing 2 million Palestinians... We're exhausting our, all of our bomb supply, so we can no longer defend the United States. By, but, you know, the Americans all want it. They want two million people did. I don't get it. Don't understand it. So I guess uh, I'm trying to think of anything else that, about modern warfare other than, you know, the, the, there's different ways to go about it. You can use your people's cannon fodder to exhaust the enemy of their, their weapon supply, and then you can take them out after that. 
Or you can do what the Russians are doing and they just keep shooting missiles after missiles and then they wiped out the entire air defense of Ukraine. So now they've got air superiority, uh, total air, air supremacy really, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, if you notice that latest barrage, uh, not many of those missiles were taken out. Uh, by the U.S. Uh, air defense is the expensive, the massively expensive that, that Raytheon and, and uh, north of Grumman and, you know, Lockheed Martin, uh, all that profit they made making those really expensive air defense systems went for naught. They can't do squat. So, all right, so peace out. Stay free and Happy New Year.